Hey guys, it's Joe here from Red Phoenix Rises, and today we're going to talk about Second Thought's new video on why the minimum wage should go up. Now, it is rather neutrally titled as The Minimum Wage Debate Explained, but that's not exactly what the video is. So let's jump right into it. Every few years, and pretty much constantly over the last half decade or so, the U.S. enters a cataclysmic debate over the federal minimum wage. Some people think raising the wage would destroy businesses and raise prices for goods and services. Others think it's essential to keep up with inflation and rising housing prices. Both sides firmly believe that their position is the one supported by hard data and evidence. But there are certain realities surrounding this debate that are never addressed. So in this episode, I'm going to address them. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be more informed on the minimum wage debate, but more than that, you'll have a new understanding of why it's such a divisive issue in the first place. Let's start with some basic history. Once upon a time, there were no regulations regarding how much bosses had to pay their workers. This was back in the early 1900s, and because of this wild west of a labor market, those who owned the factories could pay their workers as little as they wanted. And if those workers didn't like it, they could quit, and other starving Americans would gladly take their place. This worked out wonderfully for the owner class. They knew that a desperate working population would have little choice but to accept the tiny wages they offered, because the alternative was abject poverty and starvation. Over the years, labor laws were established to help prevent this predatory behavior, and in 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act established the country's first minimum wage, a system that had already been implemented in other developed nations. This legislation also banned the use of exploitative child labor, which had been an incredibly lucrative practice for early 20th century business owners. The owner class was not happy about this, but millions of parents across the country were relieved that they would receive better wages and that their children would no longer be torn to pieces by the massive, dangerous machines the business owners forced them to crawl into to fix. Okay, but were the parents really so relieved, or were they the ones sending their children to work in the factories? Also, ignoring the fact that that made it pretty much impossible for anyone under the age of, well, 16, uh, to get any meaningful work experience whatsoever now. And given we don't live in a fairly industrial economy where children would be fixing machines that could very easily chop off their limbs, it might be a good idea to reduce the age that children could work, because I'm pretty sure that a 14-year-old could be a pretty successful cashier. Almost 30 years later, in 1966, an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act raised the federal minimum wage to $1.60 per hour, and extended coverage to federal employees and some farm workers for the first time. This particular amendment is a critical bit of historical evidence. Hey, wasn't that right around the time that the poverty rate in America stopped declining? Because, as we'll see later, a recent study made some important findings regarding the minimum wage and employment. Now, let's take a look at how the minimum wage has changed over time. Six decades ago, in 1960, the minimum wage was $1 per hour. Over the following 60 years, the wage steadily rose, today sitting at $7.25. Taken by itself, this graph looks pretty good. The line goes up. Here's the problem. Just listing dollar amounts without historical context does not give an accurate depiction of what those amounts mean. Let's look at the same line adjusted for inflation. That's a lot less impressive. These peaks and troughs represent each time the minimum wage has been raised, and inflation wiping out those gains. Taken as a whole, we can see that compensation for minimum wage workers is actually significantly lower today than it was 60 years ago. This peak here, representing the 1966 amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act, marked the high point of the U.S. federal minimum wage. $1.60 an hour in 1966, adjusted for inflation, equates to almost $13 an hour today, nearly twice our current minimum wage. Okay, so we know that real compensation for workers is lower than it was in the past. Well, hold on real quick. That's not the same thing. You just completely conflated the terms real compensation for workers and the minimum wage. Now, let's be clear about why these are different terms. The minimum wage is the absolute minimum amount of dollars per hour that you could be paid for work. Real compensation is a little bit more complicated than that. For one thing, real compensation for workers, not every worker makes minimum wage. In fact, as someone who's very much working class, I have never in my life made minimum wage. Now, I haven't made much more than that. I've certainly never made $15 an hour, but I have never earned $7.25 an hour, even when I lived in states where that was the minimum wage. So even if we're just talking about real hourly wages, that's still not the same as the real minimum wage. But real compensation has yet another component. It's not just your hourly wages. It includes your benefits packages, health insurance, 401k, everything else that you could possibly get from your employer. 
Now here's a breakdown of real compensation from the Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2003. Total compensation was about $22.92 an hour, but wages and salaries were only $16.49 an hour, which is about 71.9% of the total compensation. And then you have benefits, which broke down to $6.43 an hour and made up 28.1% of wages. Now, unfortunately, the BLS doesn't do this survey very often, so this is the most recent data I could find. In this case, the actual purpose of the survey was to track real compensation since 1979. And shockingly enough, it has increased since 1979. So, again, I know it sounds innocuous enough, but this guy's done enough research to know what real compensation means. And you can't just swap out real compensation and minimum wage and expect me not to call you on that shit. But just in case you were wondering why wages are going up so slowly, which from 1979 to 2003 was in most years about 1% per year, it's because benefits packages have been growing year over year forever. Why are benefits packages growing? Why have they been growing forever? Well, shockingly enough, it actually all breaks down to Franklin Roosevelt. The very man who implemented the minimum wage also told employers to cap their wages. In fact, they were encouraged to form cartels and price fix, but they were also encouraged to wage fix. Now, how do you hire someone when everyone else in your industry is required to pay the same wage that you are? Well, you offer them a benefits package. Here's one of those big benefits. Health insurance. That's why your health insurance is tied to your employer. Because the best way to bring in employees when you couldn't raise your wages like you normally would in a market economy was to offer them benefits like vacation, health insurance, sick leave, all those weird benefits that continue to rise to this day. Now, we no longer have a capped wage system, which is why wages also do go up. But these benefits have become such an ingrained part of our economy that those packages are increasing very rapidly because people want to work somewhere that gives them a lot of good benefits. So, you know, your whole New Deal guy who saved you all or something, maybe it's his fault. But either way, real hourly wages are not the same as real compensation. But this is where we get to the crux of the matter. Many people don't care that it's lower because they believe that a minimum wage should not be a living wage. That you should not be able to support yourself on this wage because jobs that pay that little are meant to be beginner jobs, or things to keep retirees occupied. Let's talk about that. Yeah, actually, let's talk about that king of all straw men. I don't think anyone believes that you shouldn't be able to live on the minimum wage. I think you're just associating that with the opposite of you should be able to live on the minimum wage, which is your position. But I think the more honest case would be that we don't think you should need to be able to live on the minimum wage. I don't think anyone on the right is suddenly going out there and saying, hey, hey, look, that guy's living on minimum wage. We need to hike up those prices fast. Hell, that's assuming that I would even want to have a minimum wage. Ideally, I would like to see the minimum wage abolished. Although keeping it at $7.25 an hour is just as good as abolishing it because as inflation goes up, less and less people are actually making $7.25 an hour because no one will work for that little. And so pretty soon, seven twenty-five dollars an hour will be below the minimum anyone has ever actually paid. I mean, that's already basically the case. Again, I've never actually earned minimum wage despite working a lot of quote-unquote minimum wage jobs. Do students and other young people make up the bulk of minimum wage workers? Yes. Are they typically able to rely on their parents for housing? Yes. Does this mean that they don't need more money in order to simply survive? In many cases, yes. Does that mean we should allow their compensation to slip so far behind the rate of inflation that their pay has next to no value? No. Well, if you want to make money like productive people, get a more productive skill set. Students generally don't have any productive skills. Thus, they work very low margin industries that require very few, if any, skills. Flipping burgers, delivering pizzas, cashiers, all jobs that I've done. Again, never actually earned minimum wage for it, but I'm okay with what I've earned because I know that I don't actually have any valuable skills as far as the economy is concerned. See, what you don't understand is that just because people should be well paid does not mean that they can be well paid. 
These types of jobs usually operate on razor thin profit margins, usually two or three percent. Doubling the wages of all of their employees, or even increasing them by 50%, would make the business unprofitable. Now, what happens when a business is unprofitable for long enough? Suddenly, your new minimum wage is zero dollars an hour. Basically, just because you want burger flippers to be worth $15 an hour doesn't mean that they're actually worth $15 an hour in productivity. They just aren't. Justifying poverty wages simply because many minimum wage workers are students is not a valid reason to keep paying so little. Okay, but what about the fact that they aren't productive enough to justify $15 an hour? And the minimum wage is a poverty wage. According to several studies, there's not a single county in the entire nation where a minimum wage earner could afford a one-bedroom apartment. And if you are a student or live with your parents, you don't need to afford an apartment. And if you do need to afford an apartment, get better skills that warrant higher pay. Because you're not just suddenly going to get it from your low profit margin job at McDonald's. You might make $7.50 now, and if you keep fighting for $15, you'll be making zero. So you're just going to have to develop your skills slightly. If the minimum wage had simply kept up with inflation and productivity gains since 1968, it would be over $24 per hour today. Now, let's consider that productivity does not just go up evenly across the entire market. It takes pretty much the exact same amount of time to cook a hamburger today as it did 50, 60, 70 years ago. However, I think you would have a hard time arguing that it takes as much time to make a car as it did 50, 60, or 70 years ago. Now, which one of those jobs pays minimum wage, and which one used to pay minimum wage, but now pays a lot more than minimum wage? That's a lot of surplus labor value that's been taken from workers and given to their bosses. Again, only if you take the entire productivity of the market, but also, thank you for using Tommy lingo. Unsurprisingly, the owner class is almost uniformly opposed to raising the minimum wage at all. Now, who would you say best exemplifies the quote-unquote owner class? Uh, would it be Amazon's Jeff Bezos? Now, why is Jeff Bezos lobbying for a $15 an hour minimum wage? Is it because he can afford to pay it and his competitors can't, and he will therefore drive them under? and just ride it out until inflation makes it not that big of a deal anyways. Uh, meanwhile, he now has a complete monopoly on the market. Oh, wait. Yeah, that that's exactly why Jeff Bezos is backing it. Oh, and, and don't forget to add Walmart onto that list. Just so you remember, the owner class is very opposed to a $15 an hour minimum wage. But what's more disappointing is seeing people who make $16 per hour fighting with people who make $7.25 an hour when their bosses make thousands of dollars per hour. There's a certain mindset in America where people believe if I just scrimp and save enough, if I work enough overtime, if I do what I'm told, if I just work hard enough, one day I'll be the one making thousands of dollars per hour. Look, I don't think anyone has a realistic expectation of becoming Jeff Bezos, although it is technically possible. After all, Jeff Bezos wasn't exactly the world's richest man when he was young either. But look, it is shockingly easy to store up wealth for yourself. Step one, stop spending money you don't have. Step two, invest every dollar that you can afford to. Now, that's not going to make you a billionaire overnight, but that will leave you with a actually pretty comfortable sum of money over the span of your life. Of course, the owner class is thrilled by this. When the working class is divided, those who make twice the minimum wage fighting against lower wage workers earning even a single dollar more, it makes the capitalist job that much easier. Remember, the people making $16 an hour are still making less than what the minimum wage should be if it had just kept up with inflation and productivity. Maybe if I give it to you as a graph, you'll suddenly understand that productivity is just a measure of the average productivity of the entire economy, and not everything has an increasing productivity. And if you look at which jobs are most likely to pay minimum wage, service jobs, they're the ones that actually have a negative productivity growth. But let's set this aside for now and address some of the common objections to raising the minimum wage. We'll begin with the objection that raising the minimum wage will increase housing prices. I would start by asking those people, when was the last time you rented an apartment? I imagine it was quite a while ago. It's understandable then that these people are a little out of touch with the realities of housing prices in the rental market. Maybe you should get out of the city. I'm paying $325 a month in rent for a trailer. My friends who live in town are paying $450 a month for an apartment. 
Neither of these is income subsidized. These are actual sticker price rents in this area. Now, have you considered that maybe it's just really expensive to live where everyone else also wants to live and that it's really cheap to live where no one else wants to live? Now, what's the benefit of living in the city? Oh, you're a hell of a lot less likely to make minimum wage than you are out here. Although, I still haven't found a minimum wage job out here either. So yeah, in the city, wages are higher, but rents are higher. Disproportionately higher, I would say. Outside the city, rents are lower. Wages are lower, but rents are probably disproportionately lower. The federal minimum wage has not been raised since 2009. Between 2010 and 2020, the average apartment rental price has increased by 40%. Okay, so if your rents are that high, have you considered buying a house? Or, you know, renting a below average apartment? You know, I wonder if apartments have gotten any nicer in that period of time. It's kind of like houses where the prices have gone up, but houses are dramatically bigger and nicer now than they used to be. I wonder if apartments are bigger and nicer now than they used to be. I also wonder if living in the city is a bad investment choice. And by much more than that in some areas. Let me repeat that. The price for housing has increased by 40%, while the minimum wage has increased by 0%. And yet, real wages actually did increase during that time. So your odds of actually making minimum wage went down. Also, it's at least a little bit disingenuous to compare uh, rents immediately after a housing bubble collapse to rents a decade after the housing bubble collapsed and the housing bubble has actually rebuilt itself. And I mean, I, I just found that chart. I was double checking because I just thought, you know, that sounds a little suspicious. And checking that chart it is. You're basically comparing the lowest point in recent history, since at least 2000, to the highest point ever. Now, I couldn't find data for rents. I could only find prices for houses. Uh, but by all means, if rents shot up through that period and house prices dropped so dramatically, you should have just bought a house, dude. So to the people saying raising the minimum wage will increase housing prices, that has already been happening without raising the pay to a living wage. Yeah, but they are rising back to where they started. The minimum wage has nothing to do with rising prices in housing, or in any other area. When people say your Big Mac will cost $30 if the wage goes up, they're clearly not familiar with McDonald's pay in Denmark. If you work at a McDonald's in Denmark, your starting pay is $22 per hour. You also get six weeks of paid vacation, life insurance, a year of paid maternity leave, and a pension plan. Okay, from what I can tell, the $22 an hour is actually total compensation. You know, how we talked about earlier, where it's wages plus benefits. Uh, secondly, there's something you should really consider here, which is something I like to call economies of scale. In that McDonald's Denmark is a company. It's not every McDonald's in Denmark. Now, as far as I'm aware, McDonald's Denmark is a franchise that owns every McDonald's in Denmark. Very different from what we have here in the States, where your typical McDonald's is owned by a fairly normal dude. Uh, who owns usually one to five McDonald's. Uh, again, just look into uh, franchises sometime. But what this means is that McDonald's Denmark benefits from economies of scale, where because they own like a hundred stores, they can kind of pool the resources to bring costs down so that they can afford to pay those higher wages. Now, a single McDonald's or even five McDonald's don't actually bring in that much money. And that means that they don't actually have enough uh, excess profits so that they can afford to funnel them back in to higher wages. So, for instance, in the U.S., the average franchise owner brings in about $150,000 per year. Now, a typical McDonald's probably has about 50 employees. If we assume that a typical McDonald's employee works about 20 hours a week because these are not full-time jobs typically then we're talking about an additional $7,540 per employee per year, or approximately $377,000 per year to double every employee's wages from $7.25 to $15 an hour. I'm actually being generous and rounding down a little bit for you. That means that to pay all of your employees $15 an hour and keep them at their same hours and everything else, you are going to lose $227,000 per McDonald's, as in you would need the profits from three McDonald's franchises to pay the wage increases for just one franchise. 
So do you understand where the economies of scale comes into them being able to afford to do this? Their Big Mac costs 27 cents more than in America. 27 cents is apparently the difference between respecting your workers and considering them stupid, morally deficient, low-skill workers. And economies of scale is the difference between your chicken sandwich costing $1,000 and $5. Again, you're just completely failing to understand the economics of this at all. The argument that raising the minimum wage will increase prices on housing and goods has no basis in reality. Let's move on to probably the most common example. Raising the minimum wage will drive companies out of business. On the surface, this is a valid concern. Many small businesses do operate on razor-thin margins, and an increase in employee compensation could in theory make their business untenable. Let's return to that study I mentioned earlier. In September of 2020, a new report was published that examined the effects of the minimum wage increase as part of the 1966 Fair Labor Standards Act amendment. Their findings? Earnings rose sharply in all affected industries, the racial wealth gap was significantly diminished, and, most importantly for this discussion, there was no adverse effect on employment. Businesses could afford to pay their workers more, they just didn't want to. It's no stretch of the imagination to assume that the same is true today. Yeah, I mean, your only choice was to work for the biggest company around instead of any of the mom-and-pop shops, which is part of the reason that there are a lot less small businesses today than there used to be. But hey, again, I mean, if Amazon can afford to tank it, then I guess mom-and-pop should be able to too, right? Especially when tax breaks for businesses and the wealthy have increased dramatically since the 80s. Coincidentally, the period since which worker compensation has stagnated. Do you know how much I hate you right now? That is still minimum wage, not worker compensation. So, based on historical precedent, there's no reason to assume that increasing the minimum wage would drive companies out of business, especially when some of the largest employers of minimum wage workers are hugely profitable megacorporations like Walmart and McDonald's. Walmart does not actually pay that many employees minimum wage. Walmart actually pays $11 to $15 an hour for most positions in 2020. Meanwhile, despite the fact that there's a McDonald's on every street corner in America, McDonald's is not one entity. It is a licensing company with thousands of franchisees who each own a couple of franchises. Those franchisees are the ones who employ you, who sign your paycheck, and who can't afford to pay you $15 an hour. But let's return to the hypothetical that's so often used on pro-business news outlets. The mom-and-pop family business that simply can't afford to pay their workers anymore. Here's the thing. If you cannot afford to pay your workers a living wage, you should not be in business. This is how the free market is supposed to work, remember? Yeah, dude, you're totally right. The free market is when the government tells you how you can and cannot operate a business. You're spot on, really laissez-faire there. Your business is at the mercy of the market. If you don't make enough money to cover your expenses, by free market logic, you should not be in business. No, man, you're like totally right. When the government tells me to just double my wages overnight for no apparent reason, that totally makes sense. And it's totally a market failure when my business goes under. Paying your workers is the most basic expense of all. Okay, because I know that you're really this dense and you won't understand this, allow me to explain in detail. If you were to fail by free market reasoning because you couldn't pay your employees, that means that you would not be able to pay your employees the amount that you agreed to pay them. In which case, yes, your business should go under. But this isn't a market failure. The market is not what drove you out of business. What drove you out of business in this case is the fact that you agreed to pay an employee $7.25 an hour. They agreed to work for $7.25 an hour. Now you have to pay them $15 an hour because someone you don't even know told you you have to. And if you don't, they'll shoot you. That is not a failure by free market reasoning. That is a failure by massive government intervention for no reason. Again, the minimum wage should be over $24 per hour. If you can't pay your workers a third of that rate, that means the only reason you're in business is because you're exploiting people by paying them poverty wages. Or maybe that was the wage that your employee was willing to work for. Maybe they don't have many skills and you were willing to teach them those skills, but in exchange you were going to pay them a little bit less. However, after a few years with you, they can move on to a much better paying job having learned all the skills that they need. Well. That's not an option anymore. This is the entire basis for the existence of the gig economy. We're so accustomed to devaluing workers that companies like Uber no longer even classify their workers as employees, so they can get away with paying them nothing at all. But let's give small business owners the benefit of the doubt here. I'm going to assume that you genuinely want to run an ethical business that pays its workers fairly. 
I can understand how it would be a challenge to raise your workers' pay from whatever you're paying them now to $15 per hour all in one chunk. What do you mean? I thought he was supposed to go under because the free market just failed. But now you're saying that actually he shouldn't go under because, oops, it's not actually his fault that these prices just doubled overnight? Wouldn't it make more sense if instead of having to raise the minimum wage by large amounts every decade or so, we chose to raise the wage every year based on inflation and other metrics? Hey, you know what's funny is uh, most employees who stay with a business long term, um, they, they, they get something. I'm trying to think of what I think it's called a raise that does that exact thing. So maybe we don't need to raise the minimum wage because employees' wages will just go up over time if they stay with their employer. This would make the change more gradual and manageable, the workers would be paid fairly, and it wouldn't put undue stress on you, the business owner. Undue stress? What do you mean? This is a free market system and he deserves to die under the free market system. It's his fault. Other countries already do this. Instead of leaving the minimum wage in the hands of politicians, in countries like France and Australia, economic commissions reevaluate their minimum wage every year, raising it to match critical economic signifiers. It's no coincidence that countries that take this common sense approach also have a higher minimum wage relative to the average worker's salary. Unsurprisingly, the US ranks dead last by this metric. Okay, so let's assume you're on board with the idea that workers should at least be paid a living wage. That inevitably leads us to the next objection. If the minimum wage goes up, they might make more money than other low-paid workers, like teachers. I'm going to ask you to think about that statement for a moment. If minimum wage workers earn more money, say $15 per hour, still less than what the minimum wage should be, they might make more money than teachers. I would suggest that there's an easy solution here. It's not to demand that the minimum wage stays the same, it's to demand that all low-paid workers get a raise. If you guys notice on Twitter, I've been talking a lot about how uh, lefty economic policy seems to rely on, oh, there's a problem? Let me just slap yet another layer of duct tape on it. That'll surely make the voodoo make sense. This right here, basically the definition of slapping duct tape on the voodoo. Okay, so the minimum wage goes up to $15 an hour. You were making $15 an hour, so does your wage go up by an additional $7.50 like it did for everyone else? Does it double like it did for the minimum wage employees? Uh, okay, cool, so we figured that out. And let's just say that we double it, so uh, they were making $7.25 an hour, now they're making $15, you were making $15, now you're making $30. But wait a minute, now they have so much more money than you do. I mean, they have like twice as much money as you do. That's not very fair. So uh, now we need to double uh, the minimum wage to $30 an hour, but wait a minute, now you're making as much as that guy did, and that guy, you know, he deserves to make a little bit more. Uh, so we, we double his wages again, and now he's making $60 an hour, and, and, but that's not fair, he's making so much more than you. Do you see how this cycle isn't one that ever ends? This goes back to the strange American delusion that one day you'll be rich. No. If you're a teacher, a janitor, if you work a trade, if you're in retail, if you sell hours of your life for a wage, you're in the same boat as minimum wage earners. You both deserve to be paid more. But like, do I actually deserve to be paid more? Because I can tell you right now, my boss doesn't actually make that much money on my labor. So like, I don't know, let, let's say that uh, I'm a good communist and my boss deserves to make nothing. Uh, that means that my wages should theoretically go up about Oh, I don't know, 3%? So I get an extra 30 cents an hour. Yippee. That gets me nowhere near $15 an hour. In 2020, the federal government spent over $720 billion on the military. And that was just the base budget. When you account for other aspects of the so-called defense budget, you get numbers that are alarmingly close to $1 trillion. $1 trillion in a single year. More money than the next 10 nations combined spend on their militaries. There's not a country on Earth that could even come close to threatening the US. And yet we spend all this money on submarines and aircraft carriers and billions of tons of bombs. We have the money to fully fund our schools, invest in new public projects, and improve the lives of all Americans. Our priorities are just out of alignment with what the country actually needs. Look, by all means, we could spend that military budget on ourselves and have a much more meager military budget. Uh, on the other hand, that military budget has been maintaining global peace for the last 70 years, so uh, it depends how much you want Europe to fall back into chaos. Personally, I'm okay with it. Now, just to be clear, the Europeans aren't going to be so okay with it because 
uh, they're going to spend so much money on their own defense now uh, that they are going to lose all of these fringe benefits that they have been ranting themselves for the last 70 years. Uh, yeah, so again, by all means, uh, make them pay for it. We'll pay for all kinds of nice stuff back here at home. Um, it really just depends how much you like global peace. Again, up to you. Walmart made over $129 billion in profit last year. You know, I'm not entirely sure where you're getting your numbers from. Uh, per the Wikipedia article on Walmart, in 2020, they had a revenue of $523.96 billion, an operating income of $20.56 billion, a net income of $14.8 billion, total assets of $236.49 billion, and total equity of $74.66 billion. But again, profits are stolen from the workers. So let's take all of their net income and divide it by the number of employees that they have. And that comes out to $6,763 per employee. So each employee can now make an additional $6,763.63 per year. Not too bad. Now that comes out to $130 per week. And assuming that the typical Walmart employee works about 20 hours a week, again, which is pretty typical for a part-time job, uh, they get an extra $6.50 per hour. Now if they work full-time, they get like $3.25 an hour. Now, of course, Walmart just completely ceases to operate now because you have just expropriated all of their profits and they have no reason to continue investing in this company. But by all means, supermarket chains saw an increase of over 39% in their profits during the pandemic, while their workers, whom the companies labeled essential, saw little to no increase in pay, despite putting their lives on the line for their employers. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and a handful of their billionaire friends increased their net worth by a trillion dollars over the same period. These people make more money in a single hour than the average person will earn in a lifetime. And we're squabbling over giving our lowest paid workers an extra $7 an hour? Are you proposing that we pay employees in the form of shares so that they have uh, the same risks that the owner does, where uh, if the company goes under, all of a sudden, all of their money is worthless, but... Uh, fortunately enough, if the company does well, they make a ton of money that, theoretically speaking, they could sell off. Although if they were to sell it all off at once, they could potentially impact the market and dramatically decrease the value of their money. Um, you know, I don't think it's fair to compare share price increases to dollars necessarily, because in large part, for the shareholders to claim all of the money that they have held up in shares... Uh, they would actually have to sell all of the assets, including the company itself, along with all of its assets, and then they would have those dollars, theoretically. So to act like Jeff Bezos just got, you know, $77 billion in cash handed to him, eh, all I'm going to say is I don't see him buying any $77 billion houses anytime soon. There is a sickness in America that has been programmed into us over the last four decades. We are conditioned to be hyper-competitive, to see earning a living as survival of the fittest, to rely only on ourselves and see others' hardship as evidence of some moral failing. This pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps mentality has seeped into our national consciousness and completely poisoned our outlook on labor. Like most discourse around money, the minimum wage debate boils down to the fact that Americans are so conditioned to be entirely individualistic that they feel personally attacked when someone else's income inches even a cent closer to their own. Look, you lefties must live in a sad world because I've never been upset that someone made more money than me or that someone made even a similar amount of money to me or someone got close to making as much money as me. In fact, that sounds like the ultimate case of projection because you guys are the ones who are always bitching that someone makes more money than you do. It's hard to overcome this mindset. The propaganda of suicidal self-reliance and hyper-individualism makes it incredibly difficult to watch other people succeed. Because deep down, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, watching our fellow workers succeed makes it feel like we have failed. At its core, the minimum wage debate isn't just about the minimum wage. It represents a sort of proxy for all class consciousness in America. There's no easy answer here. The process of deprogramming an entire population will be a massive undertaking. But the first step must be a renewed understanding of class struggle. If you are a worker, whether you're in retail, food service, transportation, whether you're young or old, from New York or Alabama, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you sell hours of your life for a wage, you are working class. 
The owner class, the people who own the massive corporations, the restaurants, the car dealerships, the people who pay your wage and make million dollar donations to corrupt politicians, they have a vested interest in paying you as little as possible because that will maximize their profits. The struggle is not you versus your fellow workers, but all workers versus the obscenely wealthy owner class who refuse to allow America to become the country they own. A country that works for all Americans.